and uh, say that this is our patient-centered care lecture, immune checkpoint-related adverse events in 2021, Francis A. Colicchio, MD. And Dr. Colicchio, welcome. So glad to have you here. Thanks, Tim. John and I realized as uh, earlier this morning that you are by far the, the presenter who has presented more lectures for the UNC Lineberger Cancer Network than any other. So we are deeply indebted to you, and that reflects both on your commitment to, to the work that you do and also your popularity here. So thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's always a pleasure. So, so uh, Dr. Colicchio, you're with the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center and a member of the pro and a professor of medicine at UNC Chapel Hill in the Div Division of Hematology and Oncology. Uh, you've held several leader positions, uh, leadership positions in education in the U.S., including a term on the ASCO Education Council, a representative to the Association of Subspecialty Professors of the Alliance of Academic Medicine and chair of the ASCO Oncology Training Program Committee. Her academic mission is advancing training of physicians in the United States, particularly with oncology trainees. So thank you for that. And Dr. Colicchio's clinical research mission is in melanoma. She has been the principal investigator at UNC for more than 20 trials in melanoma. And uh, Dr. Colicchio, I know you, you seem to, to, to be involved in just about everything. I see you in one meeting or another practically every day. So thank you for all that you do. What's one thing we should, you'd like to mention outside of that professional bio about your interests? Well, I have a new grandchild, baby James. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Born January 5th, 2021. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's our daughter's you. child. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that yeah. is really exciting. He's precious. Exactly. Thanks. Um, all right. Well, the, our first question, immune checkpoint related adverse events refers to side effects that can occur with immunotherapy, uh, true or false. So you can go ahead to poll everywhere and uh, answer that. And while you're getting ready to do that or doing that, I will say that this activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development. William Wood, MD, MPH, and CPD staff have no relevant financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. And Francis A. Colicchio, MD, has no financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. All right, let's see how everyone's doing with that poll. I'm um, not seeing answers yet, so let me make sure that we have that after. There we go. And now they're pouring in, and we'll take uh, we've got a lot to cover, so we'll just take about five more seconds. I, I kind of see a trend here, Dr. Colicchio. How are they doing? Good. Yeah. That's a trick right. question because it's right. Uh, All right. All right. Immune checkpoint-related adverse events in 2021, and I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, Actually, this is a review. I actually gave a very similar talk in 2020, um, but uh, Tim and Bill and John wanted me to present it again um, as the checkpoint inhibitors come online for more and more cancer. And also, we thought with the COVID pandemic, we might um, explore how it interfaces with some of the side effects we're seeing. There is a lot to cover. Um, I'm going to roll in cases as we go along. Um, that will also be our poll. And I've also organized the talk so that you can go back in and see it by disease, by side effect related, and also by um, main teaching points. Next slide. Uh, so to do this, first we'll cover the mechanism of these drugs. We'll talk about the events, events we think about a lot, those that we are having that aren't that are common and we don't think about them very often the rare events that you need to know, and a term called dire or delayed immune-related events, and then situations that might increase the toxicity of these agents. Next slide. So for the mechanism, um, I like to think of the systemic treatments for cancer in these uh, buckets. When I was on service with the residents in February, we actually came up with two more, but here we go. Um, we're all familiar with chemotherapy. It's been out for over 60 years or longer, hormone therapy, which we think of mostly for breast cancer, 
target therapy, which means that you've identified a gene, this, the um, disease where that started with chronic, chronic myelogenous leukemia. Biologics, we think of that for rituxin. You're using something that is a biologic agent, but you're not actually employing the person's own immune system. And then immune therapy, which is you're employing the person's own immune system. Next slide. And so we're talking about this revolution that started in uh, 2016. Um, I've been dealing with these medications since 2009 um, when we started studying them in earnest for melanoma. Um, next slide. So we're going to really focus on the um, checkpoint. And there's two slides that explain this. This one here is the checkpoint away from the tumor. The purple cell is a dendritic cell. It's a T cell, an antigen presenting cell and then the T cell, which is blue. And there are three signals that are taking place here, signal one, signal two, and the third signal is the proteins or cytokines that get released in the bloodstream. Um, the part that you need to look at right now is that one in the middle, the CTLA-4 area with the B7 combination. This was one of the revolutions. When those combined, the immune system is off. Please click, Tim. And so we, so the, the antibody is developed to turn off the off switch. This is ipilimumab or Yervoy. Next slide, please. And then there's the checkpoint away uh, at the tumor itself. And this cartoon shows a T cell combined with a tumor cell. Three things are lining up. <coughs> well, sorry, Tim, go back. And in that slide, you'll see that the PD-1 combines with the PDL one when that happens, this um, part of the immune system is off. Click, please. And when, you, when we found these antibodies, which we now know their names, pembrolizumab, nivolumab, tezolizumab, these are all antibodies that turn off the off switch. Next slide, please. So why doesn't this work for everybody? And, you know, the immune system is complicated. <laughs> and I think we're all seeing that as the COVID pandemic takes place, is just how complicated the immune system is. Click, please. So the first thing to consider, um, Tim, if you would click on the slide, is the um, systemic immunity. And that is our, our white cells, our blood supply. Our immune systems are stronger when we're young than when we're older. Next, click. And then the next thing that we've learned is that there are genes that are involved in whether or not the immune system will uh, turn on with cancer versus not. And the two cancers that have the most um, mutations are squamous cell carcinoma of the skin and melanoma. And because those cancers have the most mutations, they're readily seen by the immune system. Whereas other tumors, like some of the subtypes of breast cancer, are not readily seen, so it's harder to develop these drugs for that disease. Next click. And then there's an area called the tumor microenvironment, which is talking about what's happening at the level of the cancer itself. What's the blood supply like? And the disease where it's very difficult to get these drugs to act actually enter the tumor is pancreatic cancer. So it doesn't work very well for pancreatic cancer. Next click. And this is the cartoon that shows that the colon is actually a very uh, big part of our immune system. The bacteria that live in our colon are essential to how our immune systems work. And we're actually doing clinical trials where we use fecal transplant to improve the type of bacteria that are in the uh, colon. I was reading about that apropos my grandson, and babies actually will draw from the mother healthy bacteria into their mother's milk. It's pretty fascinating. And then there's one more thing that I made up. Um, this slide I borrowed from Dr. Wargo, but I made up this next click. Click again, Tim. And that is the, the whole business with um, how the patient gets to you, what's their transportation like, what's it like for them at home, how much love do they have, how much care and support. And so all of this has to be working well in order for these treatments to work for the patient. Next slide. And so when we talk about the side effects from these medications, we're talking about we've activated the immune system, so we've activated white blood cells. And so these white blood cells, we want them to go to the cancer, we want them to kill the cancer, but unfortunately they may go to any part of the body. 
And so this slide, when you have, go back, have time to go back and look, will show that the eyes, the lungs, the cardiovascular, endocrine, liver, colon, you name it, any part of the body can be activated by these uh, treatments and cause side effects. Next slide. And those of us who've been prescribing these medications or taking these medications are now going to be pretty familiar with the side effects I'm going to go through next. Next slide. So let's start with this case. We have a 65-year-old gentleman who's on pembrolizumab, and he presents to clinic for his second cycle of treatment. He's been feeling well, and he points out a rash that's on his forearm. It does not itch him. His labs are normal. He has no other side effects. And he says, Doc, can I have my treatment today? And what do you say? Next slide. So in order to answer his question, you have to have some sense of what the grade of the side effect is. And so for this key concept number one, I want you to all, um, after this talk, put this tool somewhere where you can readily find it. This is the common tox terminology criteria for adverse events. Um, you can find it as a PDF document on most websites. You can also download it to your smartphone. When you go into the document, you can query it for almost any side effect you think of, including this patient's rash. It goes grade one, two, three, four, and five, depending on the severity of the, si of the side effect or the symptom. Next slide, please. And so I did that for this case, and I queried rash, and I come to this page, and I see that there's purpura, and then there's acneiform rash, and then there's the macular papular rash, which fits our patient. And you, in, you, in this uh, slide, his rash is occupying less than 10% of his body. And so he has a grade one rash. So now, can we answer the question, are we allowed to treat him with his pembrolizumab today? Next slide, please. And so to, the next part of answering his question is you've got to have this tool handy too. And that is our National Comprehensive Cancer Network uh, Management of Immunotherapy-Related Toxicities. There's a lot of slides um, and there's a lot of references on how to manage these, these things. And there is wiggle room. So you really should kind of know this one very well and then you can wiggle around the edges. To find this, when you go to NCCN guidelines, you'll find it down the page because you're probably used to querying breast cancer, uh, colon cancer, et cetera. This is more down the page in the symptom part. Next slide, please. So to answer your question about our first case, our man with our rash, he had grade one, and we proceeded with treatment with his pembrolizumab. But let's make it a little bit harder. harder. And now we've got a 28-year-old man who comes into clinic on ipilimumab, three milligrams per kilogram, and nivolumab, one milligram per kilogram. He gets his treatments every three weeks for metastatic melanoma to his lung. When he came to clinic for the start of his second cycle, he reported that he had three loose stools in the past two days. He had no associated abdominal pain, bleeding in the stool, or fever. And on exam, he appeared well, and his vital signs were normal. And I put the doses of his ipilimumab and nivolumab um, in this uh, example on purpose because the doses have switched in the last couple of years. Even in the melanoma group, we are now often using ipilimumab one milligram per kilogram and nivolumab three milligrams per kilogram. So the side effect risk and intensity will depend on dose with the ipinevo combination. In lung cancer, they use a lower dose too. Next slide, please. So can you give this patient on IPI-3, Nevo-1, his treatment today with the stool um, number that he reported to you? And I'm not going to wait for the full poll everywhere because of the number of um, uh, uh, slides we have to go through this afternoon. But the answer is technically yes. This is a grade 1 toxicity. Um, but practically, no, I decided not to. Next slide, please. And that was why I was telling you that you can wiggle around the edges when you know NCCN well and you know the toxicity well. You can make clinical judgment. And for this case, so he was a uh, grade one. Um, click, please, Tim, and you'll see his increase was less than four stools per day. Um, 
Next slide, please. And what I actually did with this real life case is I admitted him to the hospital for observation. Here's an example of another reference you can look at from 2016, which showed that on, um, for the grade one toxicity, I technically could have treated him. But next slide. But practically, since I know, um, boy, there's a lot of clicks. Since I know what would, could happen in Ipi Nevo, I put him in the hospital. And let's click on that, Tim. And so I put him in the hospital overnight. I gave him fluids, and I watched him. Um, he had one loose stool, and so I let him go home. But then two days later, he had seven watery bowel movements. And so that was grade three toxicity. And so then we launched into treatment for grade three toxicity, which I'll explain to you. Um, so this patient's temperature was 101. He had a fast heartbeat. He had a high white blood cell count with some left shift. His ALC was low, which is common on immunotherapy, and his CMP was normal. Next slide. So well, I had to readmit the patient, and when you're um, admitting your patients with uh, immune-related um, diarrhea, which is the most scary side effect that we see commonly, that a lot of things are entering your mind. You're wondering, does the patient have an infection? Does he have immune-related adverse event? The immune-related adverse event needs to go to the top of your list of thinking when you're te treating people with ipi nevo. But nevertheless, get the stool cultures, get the C. diff, do a stool calprotectant because that should show white blood cells in the stool. Think uh, about getting a CAT scan because perforation can take place and it can be hard to diagnose. Think about getting a GI consult. Think about asking the GI consult about doing a colonoscopy, although some of these cases are quite obvious and we don't need it. Get a quantifurin gold to see if the patient has ever had TB. Get the hepatitis B serology and get endocrine laboratory tests because I'll show you about that later. Next slide, please. So to manage the patient, you, you make him NPO and gradually advance the diet. And then these patients are treated with I, um, high dose steroids. When I admit people to the hospital for diarrhea from checkpoint inhibitors, I put them on IV steroids to begin with. Look at the dose in the NCCN guidelines. It usually starts out with two milligrams per kilogram for the first couple of days. And then I just translate that to um, solumedrol when we're going IV. If after a couple of days the patient is not better, then you treat with infliximab or vedolizumab. Our practice guidelines at UNC are switching to vedolizumab, so that's a change from last year's presentation. This is a slide that shows what the patient's colon would look like on colonoscopy. It's pretty old, from 2005. But you can see that there's some inflammation with the red areas on the colonoscopy. And then if you do a biopsy, you have uh, damage to the crypts, which makes the case really hard if the patient had C. diff at the same time, because they can look identical. So you often have to treat for C. diff if they have a C. diff positive stool and the immune therapy related toxicity at the same time. Next slide. Here's another slide which will tell you how to manage your patient's diarrhea. Um, I'm going to skip that and you can go back and look at it in your handout. Next slide. This is your third key concept. The steroids need to work quickly. So if you have diagnosed someone with an immune-related adverse event, your steroids should work quickly. If they don't work after a couple of days, you often will have to go on to further immunosuppression. And as I said, you can use um, vedolizumab for the patient with um, colitis. Next slide, please. All right, now we're going to bring it to 2021. We have a 48-year-old patient who is, uh, has underlying COPD. She has metastatic um, adenocarcinoma of the lung, and she's admitted with pneumonia. Her cancer was diagnosed six months ago, and she's been on monthly nivolumab. Three months into the treatment, she had a CT scan, which I did not show here, that showed that her uh, lung metastasis had improved. On presentation to the... Uh, emergency department. She had an O2 saturation of 85%, blood pressure 135 or 80, slight fever 99 degrees, and her CT scan is shown. Now that's pretty obvious that the CT scan is remarkably abnormal. What is your differential diagnosis? Lymphagetic spread of the cancer, atypical pneumonia, ARDS, and pneumonitis. So of course, in 2021, 
COVID would be very top of your differential. You need to make sure the patient is well tested. For SARS-CoV-2, I would think if the first test was negative, I would repeat it in a day or two and even consider asking the um, pulmonary doctors to consider a bronchoscopy to look deep in the lung. But since she's on nebulimab, we also have to consider pneumonitis and, and start off with steroids for the patient. Next slide, please. So this case turned out to be pneumonitis. Um, to diagnose pneumonitis, you do a chest x-ray and CT scan. The findings can be identical to those of COVID with ground glass lesions and disseminated nodular infiltrates. Bronchoscopy can be very helpful. Um, if the patient had an infection, you would expect to find something on the bronch. PFDs can be predictive on how well the patient will do as with blood gas. To manage the patient, give the patient steroids, look in NCCN for the dose of the steroids, albuterol, oxygen, prophylactic antibiotics, and antifungals for patients on the high-dose steroids. And consider adding mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide, IVIG, and infliximab. The patient doesn't improve in a couple days. Next slide, please. This actually is uh, not very common with melanoma, but it's more common with lung cancer, and I think it's under-recognized. I personally will do uh, frequent CT scans on my patients with COPD to make sure they're not developing an uh, infiltrate on their lungs. I want to make sure I'm not missing the grade 1 case because I might hold treatments even with grade 1. That, again, is working around the edges. The symptoms are, the, are dry, non-productive cough, dyspnea, fatigue, and we've already covered the differential diagnosis. Next slide. Okay, here's another real-life case. <clears throat> this is a 65-year-old treated with ipilimumab and nivolumab for metastatic melanoma to the liver. He's had two treatments when he presents for the unscheduled visit with the right upper quadrant abdominal pain and bloating. He had no fever, no diarrhea. Um, his CBC showed a mildly elevated white blood cell count. His transaminases were markedly abnormal. Total bilirubin was low. His um, synthetic function was okay. The CT scan on the top of this slide shows his liver at uh, diagnosis, and the CT scan at the bottom is the day he presented with these abnormal liver function tests. So we have to work on um, deciding what the differential diagnosis is for this patient's decline in liver function tests, as well as um, what the CT scan looks like. Next slide, please. So what is the most likely diagnosis? I give you these choices. Does he have disease progression? Does he have an immune-related liver toxicity? Has he had reactivation of hepatitis B? Or does he have uh, both progression of his disease and immune-related liver toxicity? And again, because um, we have a limited amount of time, I'll, I'll cut our poll short. Um, this was a real life case and the patient had both uh, progression of his disease and immune-related liver toxicity. And Dr. Weiss had a similar case like this a couple of years ago. One of his patients with lung cancer it was really, really hard to know if they have both the immune-related uh, liver injury and see how well the patients do. I always do check for hepatitis B for these people because we don't want to reactivate hepatitis B. Um, if patients have hepatitis C, it doesn't really cause um, the liver damage, so I don't check for hepatitis C um, anymore. Next slide, please. So the com with, with hepatitis, it's pretty common when you're using ipinevo combination together at the older dose. Um, it's not as common with the PD-1 inhibitors alone, although a couple of months ago I felt like every patient I had on Keytruda was getting this side effect. So do know it because it could be very disruptive to your clinic flow if all of a sudden the AST, ALT come back high. Um, when you have com the combined, of course, it is a higher thing. It usually comes a little bit later into the course, so if you have the first month goes by and the patient has normal liver function tests, it doesn't mean that second month they'll be okay. You just need to be on guard. Um, it can have a waxing, waning picture, um, and the signs and symptoms, there's really not much signs usually. Um, it's, they, they do, maybe they're a little bit tired, but usually it's the LFTs that are high. Next slide. The treatment um, is the corticosteroids, again, 
um, all of these corticosteroid treatments for all of these immune-related adverse events tend to be a very long course, and the patients run the risk of developing steroid-induced diabetes, um, and we're, we're using a, doing a lot of diabetes treatment in clinic now with insulin. Um, infliximab, here is another pearl, I gave you this one last year too. Don't use infliximab in the setting of hepatitis because it can cause hepatitis, but you can use mycophenolate. So if my patients don't get better very quickly from their um, hepatitis, then I will get a, a liver consult. Next slide, please. Okay. Here is our 52-year-old with a kidney cancer who's on ipilimumab and nivolumab. He presents with neck pain and headache. Um, he had his uh, first treatment. Um, he had his first treatment a couple weeks ago, um, and he had an MRI uh, before he started his first treatment. There was no brain metastasis. On examination, he's got a little bit high blood pressure. Um, otherwise, he looks okay. In his labs, there's something subtle in his labs. Sodium is a little bit low. Potassium is a little bit high. And these are one of these things, oh, Fran, what are you thinking? What are you trying to get us to think about with this case? And so this is why you got to know these side effects because you don't want to make up the uh, medical knowledge during clinic. Know this one. Next slide. Um, so what is this? Um, what kind of tests can you order to help diagnose this patient? You can ask the patient to come before 10 o'clock in the morning and get a cortisol level. So Paula and I do this a lot. Our patients will call us with a headache and we're a little bit worried about this diagnosis. Um, and so she'll say, please come and get your lab before 10 o'clock in the morning. That's AM cortisol. You can get the ACTH, you can get thyroid function tests. You can get an MRI of the brain, you can get all the above. And yes, the answer is all the above. And so when you write tests and you're a teacher, you know that don't write that for the choice because it's always right. Um, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, Tim, go back one, because in, in that slide, we cued in to what this is, and here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I don't know, my finger won't go, because Tim is controlling the slide. In the very middle of this brain, you can see the pituitary gland, and you shouldn't see the pituitary gland very easily. So what's happened to this patient is this patient has hypophysitis. The white blood cells that were activated by the checkpoint inhibitors went into the patient's pituitary gland, caused it to feel boggy, and then caused the patient's headache, and then downstream problems with the hormones. And that's why the AM cortisol level would be low. Okay, next slide. So, Hypophysitis is not very common. There may be some subclinical um, cases, and that's why the range goes anywhere from 0.4 to 17% on the CTLA antibody. It's much less common on the PD-1 and PDL one antibodies. It tends to occur later, and the side effects, um, unfortunately, can be permanent. So if the patient develops hypophysitis, I usually get the, uh, an endocrine consult. I don't have to get the endocrine consult right away, but I want the patient to see the endocrinologist at least once. And we actually had them go to Amazon and purchase a bracelet that says that they have um, adrenal uh, insufficiency. And we, we teach all these patients that once they're put on cortisol replacement hormones, we teach them that if they are sick, that's a medical emergency, they double their dose and they contact their providers very uh, right away. So it's a big problem when it happens because people can have these permanent hormone issues. Okay, we got the next endocrine case. Um, go ahead, Tim, pull the, show that case. And this is the 54-year-old on Ipinevo who, um, with metastatic disease to his brain who comes to clinic and he's shaky. And I actually had a case like this this year um, as well with a patient with squamous cell carcinoma of the skin on some lipomab. He was shaky. Uh, blood pressure, normal, heart rate high, temperatures normal, exams normal, labs are normal. Uh, I sent the patient up to infusion. Um, thyroid tests were part of the uh, lab parameters that we check on the day of treatment. And 60, 60 minutes later, I got these labs back. Click. That's a really low TSH. Click. And that's a really high T4. So what's this diagnosis? Uh, next slide, please. So you guys can vote. We have a low TSH and a, yeah, um, and a high T4 Yala Smart. Um, this is hyperthyroidism, um, but this is a bad case of hyperthyroidism. It's almost a thyroid storm almost. 
Next slide. So you got to know these things. Um, hypophysitis we covered. Hypothyroid is much more common than the other two diagnoses. Hyperthyroidism, um, you'll all become endocrinologists as you get to know these drugs. Um, we see a lot of ca subclinical cases of hyperthyroidism. Um, you can use enough Keytruda and um, nivolumab, you're going to see it. Um, diabetes can occur. It's uh, like type 1. It's direct destruction of the endocrine um, pancreas. From some of my patients at risk for diabetes, I might do a, a pretreatment hemoglobin A1C. The PDL1 inhibitors have a lower incidence of endocrinopathies. Next slide. And that's how you'll see the uh, hormone tests, and you can look at your handout, handout later for a review. Hypothyroidism, you'll have a high TSH, low free T4. Hyperthyroidism, you'll have a low TSH, high free T4. Gray's disease is really rare. We published on this. Dr. Guido is the first author. Um, I've only seen a couple cases. Um, if, you, if, if your hyperthyroidism doesn't seem to make sense, you could go ahead and order these two tests, the antithyroperoxidase antibodies and the antithyroglobulin antibodies, and then you can schedule the radioactive iodine uptake. If you're thinking Gray's disease, you probably want to get an endocrine consult. Next slide. So for hypothyroidism, the treatment is like with thyroxine. For hyperthyroidism, um, I don't use... Um, um, Methemazole uh, much anymore because um, Graves' disease is so rare, um, but do have um, some some familiarity with prescribing beta blockers. Um, it can really help with the jitteriness that the patient feels. Um, I will hold treatment with those uh, high free T fours. Again, that's based on grade, and I will wait wait for things to resolve, and then you can reserve re resume the checkpoint inhibitor treatment. Next slide. Okay, here's one more common immune-related adverse events. It's the whole grab bag of rheumatologic conditions. You can get arthritis. You can get muscle injury. You can get polymyalgia rheumatica. You can get vasculitis. And there's more, but those four I put up there. Um, and most of those rheumatologic conditions are seronegative. Next one, nephritis, inflammation of the kidney. Very, very difficult to diagnose. And you know, most of a lot of us are treating older patients. Um, now that the checkpoints are on board for so many cancers, um, we're treating a lot of older patients. And so the creatinines are often abnormal anyway. And if you look at their creatinine clearance, it may be um, lower anyway. It's going to be very hard to diagnose. Do a UA. I don't do a UA every cycle because that can be very hard. And this is not a very common thing. It's about 0.5%. But on the UA, there should be some white blood cells. If the patient's creatinine has gone up and the white, there's no white blood cells in the UA, you can treat. That's not nephritis, okay? But if there's white blood cells and creatinine has gone up, you need to hold most of the time. Sometimes I get a nephrology consult. Next slide, please. All right. We just covered all the common side effects. And now I want to go over some other common side effects that we forget about and we shouldn't forget. So here's a person with lung cancer um, on uh, Optivo. Um, she's coming for her third treatment. She's doing well. She has um, pain in her mouth. Um, I look at her mouth and um, her oral mucosa is pink. There's no lesions in her mouth. Her lips are dry. She has no swollen glands. She has some fullness over her parotid gland. Okay, so you know, this is me again asking you guys to um, formulate a differential diagnosis in your head. Next slide. So does she have mucositis, thrush, metastasis to her parotid gland, or sicka syndrome? So again, because of our time limits, um, this patient has a dry mouth, most likely from sicka syndrome. Um, today's day and age, we also have to be thinking of COVID. Um, one of the long, long hauler symptoms of, of COVID is dry mouth. Um, the patient didn't have sores in her mouth, at least by my inspection, so, she, so mucositis would be low. A lot of our patients are getting combined chemo and immunotherapy, which would probably drive up the risk of mucositis. 
Um, so, you know, patients like this might have both um, dry mouth uh, from the immune-related toxicity to the salivary glands or um, direct effect on the mucosa. Next slide. So this is common. Don't miss this thing. It's a real big bummer for their quality of life. Um, they do, you can check for ANA and SSA and SSB, but just like the room conditions, these are going to be normal tests most of the time. Um, we've used oral corticosteroid rinses. They don't really help very much. So mostly I use the pilocarpine um, rinses, viscous lidocaine, and good oral hygiene. Next slide. All right, and then here's another big one. Um, so this isn't really so much an immune-related adverse event. The, patient, the patients, like, they have underlying osteoarthritis or they've had old knee injury, and then you put them on a checkpoint inhibitor, and then they hurt there. Um, so, you know, I don't know how much these white blood cells get into these joints to add to that, but it becomes, it becomes a problem. And so I often work with my orthopedic team down the street, and they will inject the joints, and we can still carry on with the treatment. Next slide. And here's another common one. Um, lots of patients have preexisting neuropathy. Maybe they're diabetic. They have neuropathy. And then you put them on checkpoint inhibitor, and they're complaining about their neuropathy, and you think it's their diabetes. But it could definitely be these drugs. So do be aware of that. Grade it. Decide if you, need, you can treat the patient or if you have to hold. Next. All right, these are the rare events. This is your key concept number four. And now we're going to start to build a whole bunch of key concepts to go home with. But don't forget these rare ones. So I have a dot phrase in EPIC, and you guys can borrow it. Um, it's uh, FAC, consent, um, PEMBRA. I, I just use PEMBRA, but it could be Nebulimab. It doesn't matter. Um, but you have to remember that there are these one-off cases that are really gut-wrenching when they happen. You know, you, you're going to put someone you love on um, Keytruda, and then unfortunately they get something very rare to their heart or their nervous system. So just kind of mention that. You can just say there are these rare one-off events that can happen to the heart or the nervous system. And there's nothing to predict who will get that. So next slide. And so for the heart, um, it's myocarditis, pericardial disease, and arrhythmias that can take place. Um, how do you diagnose these? It can be really hard. Um, patient has chest pain. Patient comes in with chest pain. You rule out SARS-CoV-2. Um, it looks like myocarditis. You know, can SARS can cause myocarditis. You rule it out. MRI is the main test. So, so people need to be thinking about this. If they think that this is a checkpoint-related myocarditis, then you get the cardiology consult. And, of course, the treatment is going to be steroids. And we had a case last year that we were worried about. It turned out to be her cancer that had gone into her pericardial fluid, and it wasn't um, checkpoint related. Next slide, please. And then the neuro ones, it's encephalopathy, meningitis, myasthenia, Guillain-Barre, transverse myelitis. We have a patient right now in the hospital I'm worried about encephalitis um, from a recent immune therapy. Um, we had a patient last year with myasthenia gravis that I included in this talk. So they can be really devastating um, toxicities, but they're very rare. Key concept five. So in key concept five, if you're using anti-CTLA-4 epilimumab, it's about a third of the patients on the IP3 that will get immune-related adverse events. For the anti-PD-1, anti-PDL1s, the severe events are much less. They're 14, 20% range, depending on which um, article you read. Now, remember, most of these patients come into the treatment with good performance status. So patients with a poorer performance status, I can't tell you what their side effect risk is because they're not part of those original papers. And when you combine them with EP-NEVO at the standard EP-3-NEVO one dose, then the side effect is around 50%. Next slide, please. So what's happening? 2016, these things came out. We're super excited. They're um, tumor agnostic for people with a high um, MSI, um, commonplace for melanoma, kidney cancer, lung cancer, um, hepatocellular cancer, you name it. But not for everybody, like I started out with. So 
what's happening is trials and in real life combinations. So in real life, we got, you know, chemotherapy plus um, immunotherapy. We've got radiation combined with immunotherapy. We've got uh, target therapy. We've got VEGF combined, and we've got oncolytic viral therapy. So these things are happening, and the side effects are a little bit harder to tease out uh, what's going on. But generally speaking, chemo stays in its lane, and immunotherapy stays in its lane. Next. But every time I, I speak to the public, they want to know about my, my research with oncolytic viruses. So I do want to spend a minute on uh, Telemagy Leharparetvec, which is really cool in the face of, of what's going on because this is a nice virus. Um, and so this is herpes virus that causes cold sores. That's a picture of it. The genetic material is in the center. Um, and just like uh, SARS-CoV-2, there are some protein spikes. This is the only FDA-approved uh, treatment for, cancer, for melanoma cancer, for any cancer in, in the US. It was approved in 2015, so it's been out for quite a while. And how it was derived is two genes that were deleted, and one gene was inserted. And by deleting these genes, this, this drug does not spread in normal human tissues, uh, which is terrific. Um, so it does spread in the cancer. Next slide. And so when we use it in clinic, if the tumor is on the surface, uh, I'll inject it. And when the tumor is underneath, um, radiology will inject, inject it. And Dr. Olila has, um, has also injected the cancer with me. There's the case um, where the patient's tumor was on the chest wall. We injected him in clinic. Next click. And in this uh, example, the ultrasonographers injected it. Our research is now looking at RPL1, which is um, uh, a modified uh, virus from this original construct for squamous cell skin cancer. Next slide. And what happens is when we give the treatment, um, Tim, next slide, then um, the TVEC will spread. And Tim, with this one, you just click right through it. Um, and it causes the cancer to literally break apart, release its proteins which then cause immune stimulation and T cells. And so it works um, locally as well as some effect distantly. Next slide. And you can combine it with the, P with the checkpoints. And so some of your patients might be on TVEC and um, pembrolizumab or TVEC and nivolumab or TVEC and epilumumab. And the side effects are, are separate. So the TVEC will cause flu-like side effect and um, with checkpoint inhibitors, you get no additive synergistic side effects. You'll still get your flu-like side effects from TVEC, and you'll still get your checkpoint side effects. Next slide. Key concept seven is that when you sequence these drugs, you may change things. Um, next click. This example is a melanoma example. I could not find an example with um, target therapy and um, the other uh, um, disease sites that are out there, but I'll look for another year. But we learned the hard way about how difficult this can be. These are three people we took care of at UNC that had target therapy and then they got a, a checkpoint inhibitor. And all three of these people had severe rash. They were all treated in the ICU because they had um, systemic inflammatory reaction that was quite serious. We had to give them IV fluids and the like. We published about that. Um, there's the management. Next click. <clears throat> Key concept eight. Um, I get this all the time. You know, Fran, can I treat my patient? My patient has um, rheumatoid arthritis. My patient has Sjogren's. My patient has psoriatic arthritis. The answer is yes, you can. Um, and I think it all depends on what is the goal of therapy and are there any, any of the other options. Um, so if you treat these people with uh, underlying autoimmune disease, about one-third of the time, their underlying autoimmune disease will get worse. And they, their risk of immune-related adverse events um, goes up to about uh, two-thirds of these patients will have an increased risk of grade three immune-related adverse event. So you have to weigh the risk benefit out for each individual patient. And key concept nine is chemo versus immunooncology, right? So let's go to the next click, because this is really a key thing to kind of remember in your heads. 
chemo, you get it, right? You give the drugs, you know on day seven they're going to have neutropenia, they know that neutropenia is going to get better, you know they're going to lose their hair, their hair is going to grow back, um, they're going to get tired, a lot of the fatigue less, um, they may age from chemotherapy. We've known a lot about chemotherapy. That's the red um, line in this graph um, from, from the ASC annual meeting. The blue is the immune therapy stuff. The blue, the immune checkpoint inhibitor toxicity can increase with time. It can be hard to predict, and it can be permanent. So you have to kind of know that, um, especially the endocrine uh, toxicity that I talked about. Next slide. Concept 10 is delayed immune-related adverse events. Um, the, the first reference I gave you is from 2019. Um, wasn't very common. I studied this reference a few times because I think in my in my life, I've probably seen more delayed immune-related uh, events than are really reported. Thrombocytopenia I had in one of my patients this past fall, and the reference comes from January 12, 2021. Um, so you will see ITP from these drugs. It's not very common. And then DKA was reported uh, last last fall. All of these patients developed these adverse events greater than 90 days from their last dose. Next slide. Um, so here, here's where we were a year ago, pandemic. I said, oh my God, what's going to happen to these patients on, this, on these drugs? So I asked myself, um, do you think the patients on checkpoint inhibitors who get infected with SARS-CoV-2 will have a more serious or less serious COVID infection? Yes, yeah, so I was really scared. So next slide. Um, and uh, I was uh, emailing Rumi, and I was talking with Dr. Kamani, and I was really scared. All these patients were going to get really sick. And um, Learn.UNC is going to give you a lecture on that in a couple of weeks. But this is what I learned. I studied this paper in great depth. Um, I spent, I spent the summer kind of learning about the immune therapy um, immune system a little bit more. And there's two parts to this, really. Um, in the beginning, the uh, checkpoint inhibitors might actually help the patient. And there's actually an NCI clinical trial where they're using checkpoint inhibitors for patients who've been diagnosed with uh, COVID within the first four days to see if that will help them. And anecdotally, a lot of my patients will say, hey, I don't get viruses anymore. So maybe there's something to that if you can um, get rid of SARS-CoV-2 right away. It would be kind of cool. But if the virus gets a hold of the patient and starts to set up these white blood cells in the patient's lungs, and then you give the patient the checkpoint inhibitor, and this person is the type of person who gets pneumonitis, then you might be dealing with some pretty serious consequences. I really thought I was seeing that in February with one of our patients with breast cancer who was on a um, trial. Um, but as far as we could tell, she did not have COVID. She ended up having pneumonitis. Next slide. So that's a lot. Um, I'm going to close, and then we'll have some time for um, a couple minutes for questions. Here's a here's a recent report by Dr. Roberry et al. Um, 2021. Um, what she and her group did was um, combined all the studies for melanoma patients, stage three and four melanoma patients with advanced disease. There were over 1,500 people in this, and there were a couple lessons out of this. One is that it holds up that these drugs are pretty safe. About a 15% grade 3, 4 toxicity. Overall toxicity was around 20%, so pretty darn safe. And then the huge variety of complications that you can see, Guillain-Barre, myasthenia, encephalitis, diabetes, pancreatitis, which I did not discuss today, myositis, nephritis, adrenal insufficiency, thyroiditis, uveitis, hepatitis, on and on. So all this stuff that we just talked about in this past hour, hypothyroidism being by far the most common. So to do this work, to be the nurses out there getting the phone calls, to be the providers doing the management, um, it takes a village. Um, there's a, a, a team approach. Rumi has set up our team at UNC. She has awesome algorithms. There are leaders from renal, um, GI, 
that are studying these drugs and studying the new combinations as they come up and coming up with better treatments all the time. Next. So here are the take-home uh, key things. Use your common toxicity criteria to grade your uh, patient's side effect. Use a tool that you know well. I would suggest that NCC and one. Patients should respond to steroids if they need the steroids for the grade three and four. They, they should respond quickly, and if they don't, you've got to move on to more aggressive management. Patients with good performance status have actually kind of a low risk for grade three toxicity. The toxicity will depend on sequence, combination, new agents, and underlying autoimmune disease. Don't forget the risk to the heart and um, nervous system when you're getting informed consent. These side effects can be permanent and delayed. Um, for prescribers, discuss the risk-benefit in context with the pandemic. We certainly don't know all the answers. We certainly don't know how, what which patients out there may indeed get sicker when they have COVID and they are on um, checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, we do know that if they have COVID and they have chemotherapy, they may be at higher risk. And there are your two key references that should help you um, with your careers. So there, we have five minutes for questions. All right, Dr. Caliccio, thank you so much. Uh, we already do have a question in. Let me go ahead and uh, move through these. There we go. Um, so we should have one popping up in just a moment. With delayed reactions, how do you know they were caused by, by the immunotherapy? Agent? You know, it's so hard to know. In, in the patient uh, I had this past fall who was diagnosed with ITP, uh, he, was, uh, um, he had a platelet count of three, 3,000. Um, and Dr. Ma would, even Dr. Ma, with all of her years of experience, she would get, she would get three, wow. And so, wow, the patient had IgG and the full management and was discharged very nicely from wake. He might have had a virus at the same time, so it's hard to tell if it was the virus or the nivolumab. He also got um, TVAC last year. So his immune system pretty revved up, and it's really hard to know. But just kind of be aware that these checkpoints are in the milieu of their background. All right. Thank you so much. And uh, we do have just another minute or two for questions. So uh, use that poll everywhere interface to submit any questions you have for Dr. Caliccio. I'm going to go forward for a moment and just say our thank yous, and then we'll come back and see if we have additional questions in. Uh, we want to, uh, as always, thank uh, the North Carolinians for their generous support uh, through the General Assembly of, of the University Cancer Research Fund and the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. And we want to thank specifically Mary King and Veneranda Obure and John Powell for all of the hard work that they do for each and every one of these lectures. They're phenomenal, and, and we could not do it without them. Uh, we also uh, want to remind you that there are lots of ways you can reach out to us, UNCCN at unc.edu, our phone number's there. Uh, you can find us on the web at unclcn.org. Lots of information, hundreds of past lectures, lots of things coming up in the future. We're uh, looking at new series next week, uh, community college series. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on YouTube, other places. Uh, coming up, as uh, Dr. Uh, Felicio, you mentioned uh, Dr. Kamani's upcoming lecture, COVID-19 and Oncology. Uh, Mary King from our team has uh, put together a wonderful interview in our newsletter. Hopefully you're receiving that. Let us know if you didn't, but you should have gotten that yesterday or today, and you can read about uh, Dr. Kamani, and then we'll look forward to seeing him in two weeks. Uh, then after that, Making Exercise and Wellness, Part of Cancer Care with Carly Bailey and Brie uh, Castro-Giovanni, uh, so we're looking forward to that as well. What else can I tell you coming up? Um, optimizing Cancer Care Updates for 2020 with Dr. Molina. That's in our learning portal. So uh, remember, everything that you see live on a day like today goes into our learning portal for a year, and then you can rewatch it. You can share this with colleagues. They can get credit, uh, lots, and that's all free. 
uh, also the aging cancer patient population in North Carolina with Dr. Moss that's uh, just become available recently as well. And anything else? I, oh, also uh, cancer, North Carolina Cancer Challenge in 2020, improving enrollment in clin into cancer clinical trials with Emily Olson uh, and Alicia Bilheimer. And then if you have to ask, you can afford it, our financial toxicity lecture from the end of last year with Dr. Wheeler and Dr. Rosenstein. Those are available in the portal as well. So let me go back and see. Uh, oh, we do have additional questions. So let me go ahead and load those. Bear with me for just a moment. We'll bring those up, Dr. Colicchio. So um, here we go. First one, what would be the main concern when uh, weighing the risk versus benefit in regards to these treatments? Well, you know, Sue, um, the treatments are highly effective depending on the disease. You know, revolutionized the therapy for melanoma. The combination Ipinevo at five years, patients are doing incredibly well. So, you know, you, you accept that toxicity because they're so highly effective. Um, Again, very effective in lung cancer. So if you people with good performance status, I, I think on the whole, the, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about the, to the toxicity today, but gosh, it's, they're really great therapies and I would just go ahead and do it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, do you have advice on differentiating and treating uh, VEGF inhibitor AEs versus IE, ICI AEs? Is it VEGF or BEGF? Because I don't know what the BEGF is. For the VEGF, the question for oh, that is... It, it's VEGF, yes. Uh, for that one, um, you know, for, I guess it depends on which VEGF. Um, I'm most familiar with Avastin, so I'd be looking for hypertension and proteinuria um, bleeding from the VEGF, in the, and then we've talked about the um, immune checkpoint inhibitors. So if my patient presents with um, toxicity, I'd probably tease it out. Um, in terms of what side effects they're having. All right, and I think we are out of time. So, uh, Dr. Kalichu, thank you so much. This, Thanks, this everyone. And you know, those of you can email me if you have questions. I'm always around, um, and I hope you all have a great day. All right. Well, we look forward to uh, bringing you back again sometime. And uh, th thank you for all that you do. Thanks, Thanks to too. our audience out Bye, there, uh, over 180 uh, who participated today. So we, we really appreciate you. Please spread the word about this series, and uh, we'll see you, uh, see you soon. See you.